All right. What's up, everyone? So we've got our 2022 series here that I'm got a. Craig Zoller was so kind enough to reach out and ask if uh, we wanted to do, you know, a sort of a collaboration to commemorate the year and talk about our favorite records. It was a conversation that we kind of planned for a couple of hours. It turned out to be uh, quite a bit longer. So I've broken it up into four pieces and throughout the month of January, I'm going to be sharing it with you. So um, plenty of 2022 content coming your way. I got a chance to talk about a good amount of the stuff that I picked up. Um, for anyone who's potentially new to the channel, um, I don't do collection updates throughout the course of a year. I just find that there's enough of them out there for people to consume. So an end of 22 list, an end of the year kind of list provides an opportunity for me to talk about the records that I have picked up um, that are sort of newer releases and let everyone know uh, what are my favorites for the past year or what are the most meaningful records that I've had a chance to listen to. Kind of like a my annual collection update video, if you will. So in the series that I have with Craig, I go through a, a bunch of records, but we essentially, we had gone long enough and there's a couple that I didn't get a chance to talk about for the sake of conversation, so I just wanted to, as an introduction for each one of these sort of uh, 22 series, I'll be talking about one record and then we'll get into the sort of countdown between Craig and I. In the background we are listening to People of the Black Circle. This is a self-titled EP, their debut EP. It is a doom band that you can hear playing in the background out of Italy. They're in the sort of Paul Chain black hole style of uh, Italian sort of occult doom. But they've got a little bit of a goth thing going on as well. I think for newer fans, they'd probably be somewhere between Purification and Lord Vigo. So if that sounds like something that you'd be interested in, I check, recommend you uh, checking this out. Anyway, that is People of the Black Circle, debut EP here in 2022. And with that, I've got that playing in the background. Um, we'll move into our countdown between Craig and I. I just want to take this opportunity to thank Craig for um, reaching out to do this video or do this sort of a topic with me and uh, it was a lot of fun. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoy. Here's episode number one. A lot of fun. And, uh, I, when I got the, the invite, I was very excited. Uh, I had a chance to watch you over. After hearing about you, you know, Marty talk about the famous Zoller to actually put a, a, a face to it and um, have you come on and talk about your favorite records on heavy metallurgy. I was really excited to, to hear that you were interested to talk about top albums of the year for me so happy you are here and uh, and welcome uh thank you very much i started watching your program i'd seen uh the heavy metallurgy where you guys discuss battle roar and actually i bought marty that really great one um is it to death and beyond is that the last one with the original singer so that that to me is one of the the best metal albums of the last 20 years i think it's incredible in particular the song finis mundi uh, oh, and, and the and the harmonic pinches on that album are absolute like it's the best harmonic pinches in traditional <laughs> history. Like like Trey from Morbid Angel is looking over at that. Yeah. In any case, I saw you on that program and, and thought, well, here's here's an uncommonly uh, you know articulate person who and, and an intelligent person who put forward the idea of like really listening to Battle Roar, whereas um, a lot of metalheads my age and I'm going to turn fifty uh, next month. Uh, sort of like um, dismiss a lot of the modern uh, traditional stuff, and uh, and and I'm you know I, I follow that like I do all the other genres, and Battle Roar is certainly one of my favorites. So I heard all the stuff you were saying. I was like, oh, I you know followed the link over to your show, and then and then started uh, and then started watching uh, watching your programs, and, and liked a lot of what you had to say, and actually found the episode particularly funny where you and Corinne go over the logos. 
And um, that, and I, the whole time I was thinking, and, and this might not be how you pronounce it, but I was like, you could probably do a three-hour episode with that Mexican gore grind, the Pericachidio Idomycosis Proctitis. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that one name, you could probably you could probably get two to three hours of content trying to get through. I mean, I I I know I know the name, and I and I can't find it in there. So, anyways, I just enjoyed your program and uh, asked Marty for your contact info and 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 thought this would be fun to do a uh, a controlled and um, thoughtful uh, top metal albums of the year. And uh, you know, often I'll hear you talk about albums I don't know, and I think you're you're tapped into newer stuff and perhaps a little bit more open to it than the average metalhead my age. And and I think I'm atypical in that way. I'm probably going to check out you know, 100, 150, you know, new metal albums a year and probably, you know, buy half as many and then probably half as many of that, half of that number to a third of that number will actually make it into my permanent collection because it's definitely a war for space in, 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 uh, in, in my apartment in New York City. Have you, now we're going to go through our favorites here for 2022. Are yours organized by any ranking or anything like that that you know the viewers should know about oh they're absolutely they're they're organized in, in in the ranking of i have at the at the bottom of the list so i can't i have 22 things on my list so we could say it's a, it's it's a it's a top 22 for 2022 okay. um really the bottom the bottom two are about tied uh in in overlap i i believe in 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 terms of content but they're they are in um we're, we're gonna we'll start at the bottom of the list and go go to the top and there's a threshold past which where i could say okay these are albums um that like i know i will return to five years from now even if everything else the band records is bad um that like this will stand the test of time and then some of the things lower on the list i'm like oh this is a this is a pretty solid release by a legacy band, and I really like that band's sound. So I'll be I'll be clear with with all that sort of stuff. But it's absolutely in a list from the last one I say is is definitely my favorite of the year, and the, the first the first one I say is the bottom of this list. But obviously, an album I like. I, there isn't anything on this list that I don't enjoy. Okay, well, do you want to get us started then? I guess with number twenty two. I, I will. I'm going to do a quick aside. Okay. Um, this is my metal list. There are there are a couple of entries that are metal adjacent, but there are just a couple of other outside of metal. Probably the things I listen to the most in terms of contemporary music are, um, let's say, the various noise genres like um, power electronics, harsh noise, um, death industrial, all that sort of stuff, and rap. So those are the two things. So just quick. A quick drive-by of honorable mentions, um, and certainly the the label of the year for me was is uh, Deathbed Tapes. Uh, this album, Pollutant. Um, this album uh, by um, Organ Farm. And this this is and, and people who are into uh, power electronics will know Grim is a Japanese band, been around forever, and this uh, to me is is the the best release by this artist uh, since the the original two. Uh, so this is particularly good. There's definitely some maniacal kind of puerile singing, um, a little bit of folk, uh, and, and definitely um, some kind of weird warped uh, military thing going on. But uh, this, this label, Deathbed Tapes, and they have something that actually will be in the, the metal countdown for me, uh, particularly good harsh noise. Uh, in terms of uh, rap, um, this uh, No Rest for the Wicked uh, by Ransom is uh, particularly good. I think he's probably the best rapper just in terms of bars right now. Uh, Tana Talk 4 by Benny the Butcher is particularly good. Uh, this is uh, Kendrick Lamar's new one, which I think is a dramatic step up from the last two, um, which neither of which I really cared for, but... Uh, I mean, I, I think Good Kid, Mad City is is one of the five best rap albums ever recorded. Um, and I think but I think to Pimp a Butterfly is tremendously overrated and inconsistent. And I think this is kind of like that. There's brilliant stuff on here. There's stuff that feels um, uh, really pretentious. There's there are there are fantastic experiments 
with what he's doing. There's some really cool pitch stuff. Uh, it's it's a super ambitious album, and not all of it lands, but you can sort of applaud the experiment and, and the, the risk of it. And then the last uh, is this Boldy James album, uh, Killing Nothing, which is who's the producer on this? Uh, Real Bad Man. Uh, so uh, this guy is probably one of the couple best you know MCs working for the last decade or so. So that stuff is there. And then this came out, uh, this is Colossloth, uh, not that easy to say. And this is a harsh, uh, let's say this is a power electronics thing with some harsh moments. Uh, and this came out on, what is this? This is Cold Spring. So that's noise. So that's just a little aside, some things that may interest, uh, particularly the noise stuff may interest the metalhead and um, you know, and, and then a handful of, of rap albums that I thought uh, stood out. So uh, be, let me begin the uh, proper uh, metal, uh, metal countdown. So at the, uh, in the, the number 22 spot, we have the new Megadeth. And um, so this is uh, The Sick, The Dying, and The Dead. Uh, this album also features the return of the Ellipsis. It has come back. Um, it's missing. It's, it's so far so good. <laughs> uh, you know, this is that was that was a signature of theirs. So, um, uh, Megadeth is one of the bands that got me into that turned me into a metalhead from someone who just knew like Iron Maiden and Black Sabbath and Priest and stuff like this. Like this, this was a huge band for me. Uh, and Rust in Peace remains uh, my favorite metal album of all time. Oh, and uh, I think he is, uh, at his best, uh, one of the great riff writers of all time. If I'm looking in metal history, it's going to be Tony Iommi, Dave Mustaine, and probably a bath, though I really haven't liked the last two of his solo albums at all. That's n that is not featured on this list. <laughs> I, I find those really hard to get through, so I hope he, he finds his muse, because right now Demon Az is doing far better in Immortal. But Mustaine's... Interesting syncopation and, and sense of rhythm is here. His voice is a bit torched. The dude is, you know, recovering from cancer, and um, it's, is is probably better than I expected. In so far as that goes, um, the drummer here, I'm probably going to mispronounce his name, Dick uh, Dirk Verburen, uh, is really good, and that helps. Like I feel um, DeGrasso, who was the Nick Menzer replacement was really solid and had personality. And then they, he had Vinny Caliuto, who's this incredible like fusion drummer on, on um, uh, The System Has Failed. And then the, like Glenn Drover, and maybe it was just, just him or someone else, like guys who didn't have a lot of personality, like essentially could have been drum machines. They're super technically proficient. Um, whether their stuff is triggered or not, it doesn't matter because they're going to hit it so cleanly. But there wasn't a lot of tastiness to that playing. So I think this drummer is tastier by far. Uh, kind of going through the album, the title cut, uh, The Sick, The Dying, and The Dead, uh, not only an, an ellipsis, but, but an exclamation point as well. Um, you get the kind of nice phrasing that uh, Mustaine does in terms of with riffs. Like the riff and the verse feels like a sabotage thing where he's just sort of throwing in chords and and in 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 unexpected places and that sort of syncopation and and an interesting sense of rhythm is a reason why i why i rank him in, in riff royalty uh, jimmy page has a lot of that as well like i think there's a reason that uh even though i could like i, I have really mixed feelings on robert plant jimmy page's riffs are phenomenal um uh you know the, the end of this song is, and this is something that you'll get occasionally in all of this, let's say post uh, glory days, um, like post Rust in Peace Megadeth. It's not that convincing when he's doing the die, 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 and they're, and they're just kind of trying to sell that the ending is really laying in the crescendo. It's okay. The, 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 the chord progression is a bit stock. Uh, you've heard it in Hangar 18. You've heard it in In Flames episode 666. Um, but a pretty good opener. The next song, Life and Hell. Here you're hearing the greatness of his riffs, so it's there. Like, and you never know if you the gems that you're gonna get. And certainly, um, peace sells and rust and peace. I put on like a you know like on a holy tier. Uh, and I and I really really like so far so good. So what the first album I think is really good, and I really like euthanasia. 
Uh, Countdown to Extinction, I like. Uh, but you never know when you're going to get a gem from Mustaine, because I'll point to Cryptic Writings, which has She-Wolf, which is fantastic. And it has Disintegrators, which is fantastic. And has these Rust in Peace caliber riffs. And I'll point to System is Fail, which has Scorpion, and Back in the Day, which are both incredible. So you don't know what you're going to get. They just pop up even on albums that are below par. Even on that on that shitty album, uh, The World Needs a Hero, there is um, uh, Dread in the Fugitive Mind. Really good song. So it's there. And, and going through their catalog, it's I think it's 16 albums. There are four I do not like. And then probably four that are about 50 50 and then the rest I, and then the rest I like to varying degrees all the way up to um, you know the holy mountain with with peace cells and, and rust in peace um, so uh, life and hell you get this really great like poison was the cure kind of riff really really syncopated um, course is a little bit forced I'm a disease it's okay um, and uh, at the end, when you're getting, uh, again, he's bringing this life in hell. It's like, I, I think it would have been better without that idea or just with the good idea at that spot. Um, so that's life in hell. Uh, Night Spock, but again, like the, I'm, I'm, I'm first coming for the riffs. And both the first and second song deliver, particularly the second. The third song has a really great full speed thrash thing with a hammer on where I can't quite tell maybe if there's, Someone can put it in the comments if you're a musician. It sounds like when he's doing the hammer on, I can't tell if it's just a bend or if it's actually he's sliding up. Um, but there's a weird, like, has like a weird attack to it that's really, really cool. Um, the chorus gets grooved. This song, this is a really good, like, thrash song that has some other parts put in to make it seem bigger that aren't very good. Um, I mean, Ice, Ice T is on there, and as as, as you saw at the beginning, I'm, I'm a fan of rap. I'm not a fan of Ice T, and and, <laughs> and he is a dreadful over actor. Um, I'm, I'm a big Law and Order SVU fan, and and man, I wish he weren't a part of that show. Um, oh man, Corinne loves SVU. That is an inconsistent I, rotation. <laughs> that is like an 11 out of 10 performance. Her quality control is amazing. I hope someday to work with her. But I, I like I look I look at like I, I just wish Ice T took a little bit of like you don't have to sell it that much. Every line, every line isn't an exclamation point. But he he get, he's better than he was in the initial seasons. But but in any case, um, I don't want to hear him. I, I don't I don't like his rap albums. I don't like Body Cat. Like like and I and I you know I, I have a I have a top seventy or eighty rap album for people to find on RateYourMusic.com if you're interested. Uh, but that's so that song is cool. Dogs of Chernobyl um, is is decent. Um, there's a take no prisoners lick from Rust and Peace stuck in that song for whatever reason. Uh, and then you get to Sacrifice, which is not a good song. So you've got three that are that are like in the pretty good to good range. Uh, a decent one, and then Sacrifice, which is a just straight up dud. Uh, there's some you know there's some interesting licks. Uh, in the bridge, you get part of Hangar 18. So you're getting a fair amount of quotations, particularly from Rust and Peace on this album. Then uh, Junkie is pretty straightforward. This seems like something that would have been uh, maybe in a 90s album where it's showing like this aggressive, but also giving you um, uh, something that's immediately uh, understandable and digestible. And, uh, and this is something that this band has always done. Like, the rhythmic shifting under the solos is great. And that song, Endgame, the best riff on, I think the best riff on the Endgame album is underneath the solo. And the, the, the riffs under the solo and ashes in your mouth. Uh, -da 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 -da, like, he's doing these incredible runs. It's like, this is, this is who M Mustaine is. Like, that he can give you, like, riffs that are better than the best riff other bands have ever written and throw it under a solo. So you're getting some cool shifts under the junkie thing. Uh, psychopathy, if that's how you say it, didn't really stick with me. Killing time is not good. It's sort of like that a thousand times goodbye tune, but just weaker. And then we get the gem. We get the raison d'etre of this album, which if this album sucked, I would always have to keep it for Soldier, Soldier On which has an exclamation point and, and earns its exclamation point. This is like back in the day. Um, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a six, eight. So it has, it has that kind of rolling feel to it. 
you're getting all this kind of cool tapping in the chorus, but like, got to soldier on, like his... His his sing his voice is, his voice sounds good. The vocal ideas are good. The tapping is good. It's the best song on the album. It's going to be one of the best songs on any of the the albums we we discuss. And that's the thing that like Dave Mustaine can still give you a gem, and that absolutely is a gem. And I think he knows it. It might have been released as a single. Uh, then Celebutante is cool. Uh, the title's a little bit silly. And again, if you like me, really know the catalog of this band well you're going to recognize that this riff is the high-speed dirt riff, albeit with more aggro beats. Uh, and then when he re recycles it later, or the, the reprise that happens later, he plays sort of like noise junk chords versions of that riff, which itself was the, was was originally the high-speed dirt thing. The, the chorus for that thing is, is pretty good, but the momentum is nice, and that riff is cool. Uh, a Mission to Mars is enjoyable. That one has a countdown to extinction quotation in it. Um, actually, kind of in the lyrics as well as the music. Uh, course is a little bit overproduced. Too much shit going on. I would just rather have uh, raw or better vocal performances. Uh, and then he's laying the chugs. like the, 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 He's building the brick walls with chugs at the end. Um, I wish it went a little bit further. Like This is the kind of thing like Ice Earth does. Like really just like relishing the chug and building out landscapes with it. So that thing is that, that thing's enjoyable. And then We'll Be Back is the other highlight of the album. And I, I saw that title. I'm like, this is going to be one of the highlights of the album. Again, it's like it's coming off of, of, of you know, m over three decades of following this band. And uh, historically, Mustaine knows how to, how to close out his albums. Even albums that aren't particularly good tend to end pretty strongly. Uh, the verse singing in this is from Black Friday. So you're getting, it's like, it's not even sort of from, like anyone who knows the band well and hears this and be like, oh, this is the singing from Black Friday with new lyrics and not about eviscerating people and, and, and satanic rituals. Uh, the chorus is really good. Uh, I wish the performance were a bit stronger. It's a little too whispered. Uh, and then you hear like, just when the whole band is like hooking up with all these all these changes and transitions, you just hear like, this is a this is a veteran. This is like a heavy metal veteran, and this is what they do. My only my really my biggest chop on that song is there uh, sort of in the coda. There's a dissonant chord that he ends on, sort of like the one in Ashes in Your Mouth. I'm like, I don't really need to hear dissonance in my in my Megadeth. It's just, this is all stuff is all really tuneful. Um, it's a it's in a right spot. Like I know I know why he chose it, and it makes sense. And the song is still a highlight, but I just could have done without that dissonant chord. Anyways, number 22. They won't all be quite this in depth, I hope. Um, <laughs> uh, this is number this is number 22. This is Megadeth. I'm always just gonna have a lot to say about yeah. it. Followed them forever. And yeah, I know, I know. Uh, are you a fan of the band? Yeah, I mean, it's and I don't have the same level uh because I came to them as sort of like learning about the essentials of Thrash. Um I, I think. I think I mentioned this before in a previous conversation I had on YouTube, but I got into metal through punk and all my friends who were into punk or who were musicians, they were learning punk songs, but anyone who was teaching them guitar was probably into thrash. Right. Um, and I remember like him, him, a friend of mine named Marcus pulled out rest in peace and was like, you need to check this out. And, loved that uh listening to that record for the first time and just the intro when that's like sort of double times into take no prisoners i just i will never forget that sort of gear shift mm -hmm. um, and uh I, yeah I, I that's the, the i'm actually would be one of the people who would say the first side a of that i have i absolutely love i'm a little bit less enthusiastic about side B just because I feel it mellows out a little bit more. Like you see the Marty Friedman sort of flex on side B of that record um, where I feel like, like uh, five magics, for example, that sort of progressively builds downhill. Um, and I, I absolutely, it's a, it's a classic record to hear. It's your favorite um, of all time uh, was interesting, but I don't have the kind of relationship with that record to where it would warrant going back to every single one in the catalog that, that followed. Right. Um, but 
Yeah. And, and if like I had to choose between some of the classic sort of big four records. Yeah. The two that you mentioned, Peace Cells and Rust in Peace are probably going to be the two that I feel most passionate about. But yeah, those, um, those, those are definitely my, my, my favorite. I mean, the only thing I'll say is if you haven't spent a ton of time with with Rust in Peace, the stuff on the second side, because, I, you know, obviously for me to rank it where I do, I think it's I think the worst song on there. Like Dawn Patrol is, is, is an interlude. Yeah. The worst song on there is Poison Was the Cure, which I still think is very good. But uh, Rust in Peace, Polaris, in terms of riffs, those are just monsters. And then it turns into that, that like, riff megalopolis at the end that is, like, that is not beaten, I think, yeah. I think ever. And, and, and Tornado Souls, like, I think that's the first time he just said, like, here's an extremely tuneful chorus, and it's going to be great. Uh, yeah. and so he was starting to do that thing, and, and I think, you know, like, and, and same with Metallica. We, this this tangent could go on for <laughs> um, uh, Those Both of those, it's, it's like, although certainly, you know, some underground people and, like, like, oh, these bands sucked in the, in the 90s and, uh, and, and, and lost everything. I was like, these, both of the lead vocalists progressed as, vo as, as, as singers. And, um, uh, and, and while there's no, there's no 90s Metallica album I, I really like, uh, and and uh, there are there are definitely Megadeth albums like in the Megadeth versus Metallica. I've always been in the Megadeth camp, and uh, but they progress like it wasn't just like we're gonna get simpler and we're gonna we're gonna court the mainstream, which of course they did. It's like some of courting the mainstream means like okay, like as vocalists you you need to, you need to push forward. So there are a lot of really good, particularly on euthanasia, a lot of great choruses, and um, but but in in, in any in any case. Um, we should not go down this road because I can. <laughs> what I just did on this it's album, I can do for yeah. one. So that's another. That's that we should <laughs> we should move okay. forward. What's what's but, what is your, what is your pick? Is it and how are you organizing your list? Yeah, so I um didn't sort of. I really don't have a, a tier, or I am not as well sort of organized um in terms of how you I would rank them. Uh, but you probably would be able to glean by my description in, in terms of which ones feel like the most essential. Um, okay. But you know how it is. Like you asked me a, a, a week from today, you know, my it'll change. So um, nevertheless, I will, uh, I'll jump into my first record here. Kind of give me the spot. Okay. So um, this is, Get my camera right and get the microphone out of the way. Uh, near death condition. Um, and this is called Ascend from the Mundane. So first off, I have this relationship with um, Unique Leader Records, where they played an incredibly important role in my death metal consumption early in the 2000s. And uh, I've kind of swayed or been pulled away from that label um, in the, I would say over the past over a decade now, they've kind of opened themselves up to the death core side of the, the world, which is not my lane. I'm, 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 I'm with you. That, that, that name used to mean something different to me than it does now. Yes. But just like I, I was an interesting, just like how Megadeth made such an important impact on you at an earlier time period in your metal listening, every once in a while, it has sort of will pique my interest and I will reach back into that well to see if I can pull anything of substance back out. And uh, so near death condition, um, they're from Switzerland. And they play a style of death metal that probably has roots in Morbid Angel and Deeds of Flesh. This is their fourth full length. I think the last record they put out was in 2014. And it moves away from those like you think of, you know, uh, Morbid Angel and Deeds of Flesh. That makes sense in terms of old school unique leader so when you say deeds of flesh you're talking like gradually melted not like whatever the the science fiction tech of, yeah of yeah we're we're like probably ending somewhere around 2003 2004 okay 
Um, but uh, yeah, the, the the latter technical side of them, they, they sort of veered in a direction where I, my listening went in a different sort of space. But that's a, that's a larger conversation. Um, this, though, almost starts to introduce some like acker cocky. Um, there's, it's moodier and thematically is based on, um, Carl Jung's notion of the shadow self. So it's actually, it has an interesting sort of, I, I'm, if you got me talking about clinical psychology, this is going to be a very short conversation because I don't have a whole lot to offer, but, um, <laughs> but, um, it's, I guess from a label that I had written off and a band that really had not touched base with that played this incredibly intense kind of um, sort of relentlessly blasting death metal. It was cool to see how eight years later they had found sort of room to artistically sort of open new doors. Um, it really, the first track, uh, Witness of the Martyr, kind of gets... It lets you know this album's going to sound different than what they'd previously been playing. But it's the back half of this record. So side A ends with the bridal chamber and moves towards astral journey and ascent from the mundane, the title track before he kind of has two sort of instrumental outros. Um, but it was a like refreshing to hear a record that uh, from a label that is playing in this kind of death metal style that I am nostalgic for in 2022 so it kind of brought me back to that and it uh also showcased a degree of like maturity in songwriting so i like how they took their time and weren't just trying to play 250 beats per minute you know song after song awesome. That the sort of extremity ends up being a game of sort of diminishing returns. It quickly exhausts itself. So it, it, I think it takes a little bit more talent trying to find inventive ways to keep your audience captivated. And uh, sure. this, you know, showed up earlier in the year and uh, piqued my interest. For people who may look at that cover, it looks into some degree like the new uh, immolation record. <laughs> so uh, it, it may catch people off guard, but it's near death condition. Um, ascent from the mundane on unique leader. Cool. I'll check that out. I, I don't, I don't know that at all. I don't have an, an opinion I, I, either way, other than it sounds interesting. Yeah. A little bit, a little bit different. So that is my first record in the books. We're going to switch this back over to you here, Craig. All right. Cool. So, um, uh, most, of, most of these are not legacy bands, but we are starting with two legacy bands as, Number twenty one, and and I I I I I acquire a lot of music around like November through the first couple weeks of 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 uh, January because I enjoy watching you know lists. I'm a compulsive list maker, and I like seeing what's out there. I've I've yet to see anyone include tankards, Pavlov's dogs. Oh God, here we go. At this <laughs> P A W G S. Um. So the so um. I don't need to go in as much detail on this. The thing that's interesting with this is um, you're not going to see a creator um, CD. Really, you're not going to see any creator um, that I have anything good to say about after a comb of souls. I, and I'm someone who like, if I'm into a band, I'm going to give them a chance and stuff like that. That's a band I probably get in seven or eight chances in terms of buying albums after that period. And I, and I just think it's awful. And one of the the main things is the, the, the voice is so bad. It's like a bad, is the At The Gates guy, is that Thomas Lindbergh? Is that his name? So it sounds like a bad impersonation of him, so it's dreadful. So in terms of, <laughs> like, I've never been into Sodom, so they're not part of the conversation for me. Creator who did the, the like, they opened for these guys on this show. Yeah. But I saw a, a, a couple of months ago, like, Creator Live was absolutely terrible. Um, and uh, part, mainly because of their um, their song selection. Like, it was just all new stuff. 
and then teasing out, uh, you know, other stuff. In any case, Sodom I'm not into. Creator, to me, that catalog stops with Coma Souls. I've never enjoyed any albums released after that. And Destruction, there's some moments on Antichrist that I think are decent, but for the, for the most part, the, um, what is it, the reject emotions, like that's sort of the stopping point for me. And one of the problems there is the modern production of Destruction produces his voice a bit more in a hardcore shout. Um, typically, if you use me, if you hear me describing a vocalist as shouting or hardcore, it's not a compliment. I just, I don't <laughs> like that music. And, um, and then they, and in addition, it was his name, Mike, Mike Schmier, I think is the destruction vocalist. In addition, they painfully overproduce his backing vocals. And it sounds like Danny Filth and Nagash and a bunch of black metal bands are singing like the, the what would have been gang hall chants. It's this like overproduced, like kooky black metal creatures of the realm with all of this like pitch shifting. I just think it's it sounds really bad. And then the recent Destruction albums, including the one that came out this year, um, there's some good riffs on those like that. You know, I, 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 I read Schmier taking credit for writing all those riffs, even though he's not the guitarist, uh, it, you know, even on the, on the classic albums. But those classic albums have some all time great riffs. The riff in the ritual nah, 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 like that is all time great riff writing. Uh, those first two Destruction albums in particular are loaded with it. Uh, and surprisingly, the kind of joke thrash band of the four is the only one I have interest in at this point. They put out an album called Beauty and the Beer that I think is better than most of their 80s albums. Maybe this came out in 2003. And part of the reason is this singer, maybe his name is Hank. Um, they're big on the first names in this band. Uh, is it? This singer still sounds like this singer. He has the he has the playful personality that he did back in the day. This does sound like the guy who sang Zombie Attack and um and, and all of that sort of stuff. So he still has the charm. And the band has shifted. And I would actually liken it to the Megadeth shift, and that both of these bands were straight up thrash bands at a certain point, and then just started incorporating more and more traditional heavy metal elements, where like at this point, like the difference between this. Musically speaking, not not vocally, the difference between this and something like the system has failed or cryptic writings by Megadeth is not that much. Um, you're getting a lot of rolling, um, a lot of rolling uh, six eight stuff with um, like kind of that slow tremolo picking um, somewhere between maybe the recent, more recent Megadeth and like Running Wild. Uh, so the, they have gotten more tuneful uh, with time. Certainly not the case uh, with Destruction, but the refrains are good. Um, uh, this isn't a band whose sound I love. I have their I have their classic albums. I might go a calendar year without spinning anything by Tanker. This is not, but I, but I can also recognize like, man, if you're really into the Tanker sound, this 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 should this should rank quite highly for you. I think Beauty and the Beauty and the Beer was better, um, but uh, you get you get a lot of like kind of traditional metal touches. The intro to the first song sounds like Hellion. Sounds like Priest Hellion. Uh, the, the second song, the uh, X influencer, uh, where they are singing about Instagram, uh, is rolling the bass, melodic lines. The chorus is good if you can accept that they're singing about Instagram. But again, this is a band's like Beauty and the Beer. Like this band is right, right. playful, and they have remained playful, and they've just gotten more tuneful. Um, the stop start rhythms under Beer uh, Beer Barians, if that's how you say it, is is. <laughs> Dire of a Ni Nihilist is kind of the first one with a proper, like, thrash D-beat. And, um, and, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty decent. You get to track five veins of, of Terra is one of the ones where it's like, man, this is, this is really starting to overstay its welcome. And this is ultimately why I don't rate this album higher is these songs are pretty similar that the, um, the beer all singing chorus, the memento, of uh, ex uh, ex fluencer uh, Pavlov's dog, um, which is singular, not to be confused with the album. <laughs> like those are they're they're enjoyable, but they're they're similar. And a lot of these things are like five and a half six minutes. And um, uh, clear, like I've I've received criticism as as a director, like how long my movies are. My albums, I've got like nine albums in different genres out there. Probably at the median length of my albums is probably like 38, 37 minutes, which is below average. And my books, 
Uh, my novels are average length. So it's not that everything I do needs to be super long. It's just I find the movie parameters a little bit confining. And I, But I would say one of the reasons that my albums are all on the slightly below average size to like straight up shorter is because songs are discrete artistic creations and you can get rid of the ones that aren't as good or you can get rid of the ones that aren't redundant. Sometimes I have a scene in a movie or a book that's less good than the scene before and after it, but it's essential to the plot and needs to be there. And then some of the scenes that might seem excessive, I think are better, so I keep it. So this is ultimately the 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 the, the blessing and the curse of this album. It's like, it's very consistent. Most of these things are an enjoyable rolling 6-8 thing that's kind of running wild with some Megadeth touches. Um, but like Lockdown Fever, that song could end at three minutes as opposed to going over four. Uh, and then on The Day I Die, the last one really feels a bit like a different song. That feels like a more personal uh, thing and, and conclusive. So overall, it's like, well, this is a, this is a shit ton of tankard. And it's like, I don't I, like I don't need a, like a 52 minute tankard experience or whatever this is. And this thing would definitely rank higher if. Uh, they dumped a couple of the weaker the weaker cuts and just had it condensed because it's playful. Like it is, it's there's a little bit of punk in the in the in his vocal approach, and uh, and it's generally always moving to a catchy chorus. There's a ton of rolling double bass six eight stuff and and catchy melodies and and like maybe about ten percent of it legitimately sounds like thrash. Um, it's more running wild and whatever Megadeth turned into. Uh, so, anyways, it was. It was um, uh, better than like the last one. Not as good as Beauty and the Beer. If you're interested in checking out post '80s uh, Tankard, but if you didn't like the original <laughs> issue of Tankard in the '80s, no need to check this out. But in enjoyable, fun, and of like, as I said, I'm not a Sodom fan. Like, I don't like that that band. So, like, I'm not like they're not going to appeal to me the way like Anthrax and Testament. I have no interest in those bands. Um, so I can't speak to what Sodom is doing, but I can say compared to Destruction, who to me did the best German thrash albums, and to Creator that had this really good initial run of albums, like this, these are the these are the dogs that are standing. <laughs> Man, so that is uh, that is a uh, that I not many lists are going to have that. <laughs> I mean, just when you when you saw that album cover, did you think like this is exactly what I want from Tankard or? Were you like, what I mean, the world is going I, on? I, 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 <laughs> I begrudgingly accept the amount of like jokiness that they throw in. And sure. if the music weren't legit, like for me, it's a little something to get past. And Instagram, like them singing about Instagram. But it's, but again, like from at the beginning, and this right. is maybe one of the reasons that, that the, 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 uh, the zombie attack album is, um, is is better it's like we'll focus a little bit more on horror movies i'd rather like as opposed sure. to non-stop beer and getting wasted though there's plenty of beer and getting wasted on that right. uh you know, on that it was like maniac forces though there's a lot of really good stuff on that on that first album and but but again like of of the bands of that era like this is a this is a completely respectable album if you love tankard you should be really happy that they have that they're still putting out stuff at this quality level because I, I do not think destruction and creator are. How dare you have a good time, Craig? How dare you? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Try not to smile. Let me get rid of me. Okay. So here we go. So this is a little bit in that uh, adjacent category for me. Okay. Um, so this one, this band is, is there, I guess, second full length. And I think the first one just was released digitally. Um, but here, this is, uh, and I will put all the names of these um, records in the comments um, and I'll highlight as people if do want to look it up for my poor pronunciation here. But Vitzkar Sudan, um, American band, it's called The Faceless King. And it is a bit of prog, a bit of doom, and like goth country. Hmm. Um, but the themes or the concept for it is out of like sword and sorcery uh, fantasy. Right. So 
a really interesting sort of just dark rock, I guess is the, what I would call it. Um, if you go into it looking too much for that doom element, you'll probably be disappointed, but it's a slow moving sort of strange dark rock record. Um, so the vocals yeah. are the vocals are are pitched. The guy's singing clean the whole yeah, time. Yeah, they're they're singing clear. There's no like screaming or anything like that. There's no guttural aspects to the vocals. Um, it probably would be now. I've seen the band talk about enjoying like the Finnish doom scene, like the Reverend Bazaar, um, the best, best doom band of all time, by the way. Like that okay. number yeah, one. You you won't get any argument from the Finnish doom scene for me, but. Um, but I, I mean, it is, if that is like that Pink Floyd, King Crimson side of this, though, that I, I also it's probably would say of all time features it more prominently. Um, I, but it, it ca caught me totally off guard. The, the record, the album cover kind of spoke to me when I first saw it. And um, I was kind of in the mood for something just kind of moody like this. Anyway. Anyway, you'll appreciate this. I, I I heard that you know we were going to do this. I wanted to make sure to bring this little piece. So it comes with a um, adventure character book um, <laughs> that uh, I guess it features the. I I'm not a like Dungeons and Dragons person here, so you're gonna you're gonna have to like at least school me. But like we have uh, the Matt, okay. Um, but there's all sorts of like character information and probably of, descriptions of the room map. Yeah, that are exactly. There. Like, so I, I, I grew up playing this stuff and still play it to this day. So, okay. All right. So I, I knew at least the fact that they have like some sort of character, whatever, a, a game that you can play along with it. Um, the sort of, I, I'm sure they wrote the record and then correspondingly wanted to add this in to sort of embellish all their sort of narrative. Um, mm -hmm. But you get the lyrics on the back there. But it, you know, like the title of the record, The Faceless King, this sort of adventure follows the same sort of plot lines. Um, nevertheless, it was a cool little addition to this record. I have yet to like, outside of me just enjoying the book um, to look at and sort of a fun concept, I haven't like played it or I don't. Right, right. I, I, it's probably better suit. I might just send this to you, Craig, and you can give me your review and how well the game goes, but. Well, I'm gonna. I'm certainly interested. I mean, you 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 name check like Reverend Bazaar, my favorite Doom band of all time. Pink Floyd, my fifth favorite band of all time. King Crimson, my second favorite band of all time. So you hit a lot of you hit a lot of pinnacles with that with that description. So I am beyond. I am extremely interested to hear what that is. Yeah, it's but I and it's that like goth countryside of this is is another you know key piece that makes it sort of feel. Um, adds an element of like uh, color that is different than a lot of the traditional rock stuff that you would hear. Right. So um, it's not, you know, goth in, in the way that you would probably think of like the cure or something like that. But it, it's definitely a little bit more, uh, I guess, based on like an American side, like woven hand, I think is a band that they mentioned here. Um, so Anyway, a, a really fun listen and a change of pace um, by comparison to a lot of the stuff that comes across, you know, my, my listening um, habits over the course of a year. But it was a big surprise. And uh, I wanted to include that as a recommendation on Ripple. So Ripple, um, I believe, does a lot of like doom, psych, stoner stuff. Um, it just doesn't really fall completely into that category. But nevertheless, I will... Uh, include it on my favorite records here for 2022. Yeah. Sounds, sounds really intriguing. I'm going to check that out. All right. Okay. You're up next here, Craig. So number 2020 for you. So uh, let's, let's, let's go, let's go north of the border. Let's go to Canada. Um, 
Skull Fist. And uh, I, I, I've not heard of this band, and I think maybe the um, that um, Chromium Dioxide, I don't know his name, was on Metal Earth. Yeah. He did, I don't know if he did this cover, but he worked with them at, in some capacity, and they, and they mentioned them as a you know, new wave of true... Uh, heavy metal band and I'd not heard of them and I always check out these things and it's usually like an instant like it's an instant reaction for the ones I I um I like uh but then I'll listen to a couple of a, a couple of tunes because owing to the kind of poppy nature of these choruses like you might just land on a good chorus once and never do it again like I, I really uh you know like some of the some of these bands like I'll point to a band that I got better as opposed to Something that got worse, but like there's a Swedish band called Screamer, and they had an album that came out maybe Highway of Heroes was the last one. It was really good, and then I got all and I got two of their albums that preceded it, and I like nothing on it. They weren't bad, but they just completely landed on that album. So this stuff can be real hit or miss, like that they just land one awesome song. So I checked this out and and um, liked it enough to get it. Uh, and obviously it, it, it made the list. So this is the, the lead singer has a really um, youthful quality. Um, I should probably know some names. How about uh, Zach? Uh, is it Schottler? Okay, let's go with Schottler. Might be Schottler. Um, so he has a really youthful quality. Like I, the, I mean, the, I'm definitely thinking of um, Joe Elliott on like the first Def Leppard. Like he had, he, and he actually sounds like him. So it's that sort of thing a little bit, um, how, uh, Maycock sounds and some of the high spirit stuff minus some of the grit. Uh, the production is really nice. You know, like, I don't know this, so uh, this, this label is atomic fire. I don't know. I don't know what that is. I have no idea how, yeah. I, I, I don't know how they, um, like how much money they have to do that. But like, this is a really, this is a well-produced album. It's really punchy. Um, the drums sound nice. And, uh, and like, in, like in terms of the overall thing, there was a band, um, was it called, was it Primitive Man that had like, like, was that the band that was like, uh, they had like, uh, Beware the Circling Fin? Uh, I know Primitive Man. I, are you talking about like an album title? Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, but, but in any case, so there's like a, there's obviously there's a traditional metal thing going on with this album. Um, and, uh, and something that they, something that I guess differentiates them a little bit from some of these other bands where there's like kind of a tongue in cheek element and this album, you know, paid in full, uh, with songs like long live the fish crush, kill, uh, destroy, uh, and heavier than metal, there's a playful aspect to it. Uh, but the music, there's uh, oftentimes there's a little bit of a somber side, like the paid in full. Um, when the harmony vocals come into that to that chorus, there's another emotional layer. It isn't just like, you know, the the traditional metal thing where you're going for a catchy chorus and riffs that you know like. Like half of these riffs could have been on British Steel, but they put little, they have nice little details around the edges. Um, uh, and you'll get like, and, and it seems that the guitarists are really having a nice conversation in terms of the playful trading of leads in the first tune. The second one, Long Live the Fist. This you've got um, uh, kind of the, the riff from, from Priest Exciter, and then it goes to a cool twin guitar lick. Um, and then the, I, I want to live forever. And, and so there's, so I, there's, there's like a hopefulness and, and it's something that I just, you know, maybe, maybe just as an older dude, I just associate it with like a youthfulness, um, that this band has, but they do have some other colors. It's not just, um, that like all positivity and there's a cool bass break on um, their shred breaks, um, and crush, kill, destroy, they get uh, they get a little bit more like something like in the Megadeth camp, uh, blackmail the universe, where it's a rolling, you know, kind of six eight, and um, and I, my guess, like I, I feel like Priest, uh, British Steel, um, really early Def Leppard, and nineties um, Megadeth, the better side of it. That tends to be a lot of what I'm hearing on this, uh, and and then. 
like a song that I don't particularly like on this is Blackout, which has like a punk thing. You, you said that you started uh, from the punk background and that, that's just music I haven't gotten into with the exception of uh, Turbo Negro, if you call them punk. <laughs> and I think they are punk. I like that band. Um, if Amoebix is punk, I guess they're cross punk. I like that band. That might be okay. the that might be my list of punk bands that I'm into. <laughs> uh, like it's just not like so. That's also sort of like if I'm if I use the punky description, a lot of times it'll be uh, as a it's pejorative. <laughs> yeah, like it's not it's not a, it's not a compliment. So so that one that blackout song has a little bit that. Then Madman, and this is one of two things where I'll, where I'll make a reference to this. They're like they're kind of getting into the the um, uh, the Rudolph Shanker kind of the strafing riffs that he does sometimes in the slower Scorpion stuff. So this sounds a little bit like that China White song, uh, which I will bring up in a, in another even more relevant passage. Um, uh, and then Heavier Than Metal, this thing is a good new wave of British heavy metal song. Like if you like if the production was less clear and and you put this on a you put this on a forty five Allen from Heavy Metallurgy would be all over this like it's it's just a new wave of British heavy metal song and and a good one the the last song Warrior of the North pushes a little bit more the double time power metal thing uh, and has some uh, some cool deeper harmonies and and again with some of the rah rah that seems like kids sort of just imitating stuff from the 80s, so they're making some nice choices that that it does, where it doesn't seem like that, in particular, like, um, ending on a lower note as opposed to just, like, everything is sailing through the stratosphere. Like, I am a warrior, or wherever he lands down there, it's it's just tasteful. And there, there's there's just a lot of the details are nice with the leads coming up all over the place. It's it's really enjoyable. There, there are a couple new wave of, of true heavy metal things on on my list and this is this is very this album is very easy to like and for someone who's looking for their mind to be blown by all new sorts of ideas this album is not for you um like that like that break on through the night if that's what that first uh Def Leppard is called a little bit like British Steel some Megadeth flourishes a little Scorpions like that that's that's what you're getting except I use those as reference points but there's a difference between sometimes using like reference points of people actually taking music. And for the most part, they're not doing it. There are one or two things I was like, oh, yeah, that's from Exciter. But for the most part, they're writing their own original things that have nice flourishes. And it's just a fun album. Very easy to like if you're if you're uh, interested in the traditional heavy metal. I'll definitely have to. I have that one I missed this year. So I will have to check that out. I've got a few uh, within the world of new wave of traditional heavy metal floating around here too as well so cool. i'll i wonder if we'll we'll cross paths here at some point we may okay as good as that last one maybe not that last <laughs> one. I, got, I got my uh megaton sword here shirt going i don't know if you yes okay so i turned marty on to them and i i've gone on record many times they are uh they are the best traditional heavy metal band to come out in at least 15 years like I remember when Doom Sword started, and when Battle Roar released those two awesome albums, I would say that those are competition. Uh, uh, Megaton Sword has only released two albums, um, so it's like it's not a huge catalog to assess. I'm right. a big believer in three. I try and do three of anything that I do before I move on to something. But those those two are phenomenal, and they were both ranking in like my top few albums for their respective years. That is that is the best traditional heavy metal band going including um i would put them i would rank them over um a lot of the ones even the ones that have returned to form like like halloween and and sirith ungle and those things like like megaton sword all day every day um i wrote them a fan email at some point <laughs> their, their ep that that shit is incredible i, I would right. try to see them okay well switching gears here um, I don't have a traditional heavy metal record for you. Um, I have some uh, dark, scathing, raw black metal from Belgium. Um, so this is Forbidden Temple. Cool logo. Yeah. Um, I think they... Now, I cannot confirm this, but I believe they share members with uh, Perverted Ceremony. I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with Oh, them. yeah. They're, I like their second one, but their first EP that like 
like I'm not like there's spots I'm like is this just bass guitar going but that it's so heavy on the bass guitar their second thing was good that first thing I actually remember I think it was on Caligari Records I bought multiples because I knew I was going to wear out the tape I love that thing yeah so this is 100% on board with that if that is sharing oh, yeah. that if you if you're into perverted ceremony you should check out forbidden temple so um seed into the black pentagram uh, or step into the black pentagram i'm sorry step into the black pentagram is the title here but um yeah it's got like to the point where the guitar tone would almost remind you of a raw black metal but it's so bass heavy um that it, it sort of changes the analysis right like texturally it reminds you of, of raw black metal but the weight involved would sort of challenge that kind of analysis. Right. Um, That's a little bit the Greek style, like the necromancia on some of those. Yeah, really yeah, pushing, for sure. Really pushing the bass forward. Who, who put that album out? So I can't, uh, Graham Tish. I can try and get the, I have the correct uh, pronunciation. I, I, I can, I can write it for you or send it your way. Yeah, um, I think I think actually it was nuclear. Maybe it was nuclear war. Now that put out that. Yeah, they put out the perverted ceremony piece. So this yeah. is a different. Um, yeah. But yeah. Anyway, so out of all the, I, I don't listen to tons of this, um, just because it can prove to be a lot of the same. Like it's you're either committed to the style and it's something you're into and you're going to hear a lot of the same thing. It's, it feels very much like. Um, a certain kind of allegiance in terms of an artistic representation, right? You aren't necessarily looking for diversity as much as you are like authenticity. Yes. Um, and uh, yeah, everything that, if you know the sound involved, people who are unfamiliar, there are well-placed um, synths and acoustic sort of treatments here, but really it's this in like high scathing wash of sort of doomy black metal. Um so one of the better records in the style this year. Um, once again, I'll put all the names for like records and um, record labels, so on and so forth for people who are interested in picking this up. But uh, awesome black metal record here for 2022. I haven't heard a lot of people talking about this one, but I'm sure if you perverted ceremony has been around for a little bit and have made a name for themselves. So um, hopefully by association, people start checking out Forbidden Temple. Yeah, I'm, I, I pretty much I'll probably just go buy it if it's those guys, um, and the, and the the synthesizer stuff they do is so uh, tasteful in so far as like it it's really just the creepy atmosphere enhancer. It's not driving it. Uh, right. They have really good taste with that stuff. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Graham Shap, G R A S C H A P. Uh, it's the, the record label. So it's or they're, they're whatever. I, I I gave it a shot, right? I did my best. We'll, we'll... Oh, right. oh, I'm gonna have a couple of those. I'm gonna have a couple of uh, <laughs> pronunciation stumbles. <laughs> okay, awesome. So I'll let you uh, move on from here, and you are up number nineteen. Yeah. So the the legacy bands. I realized like oh, they're they're pretty much all in this initial burst. Uh, Scorpions, and. Uh, so I'm a I'm a longtime Scorpions fan. Certainly one of like when I look at the initial bands that got me into metal, like when I was like a, a child, like elementary school uh, level. Scorpions, Twisted Sister, Quiet Riot, Def Leppard. You know those are probably the four. And uh, Scorpions, you know, like you you don't necessarily know what you're gonna get. I mean, you know they're gonna they're going to tell you it's the retirement tour or their last album. For like ten or eleven albums, you're gonna have that experience, and they're not they're not gonna deliver. But um, this is the, like for me in the let's say the post crazy world. That was like when they had the last time they had all those hits, Winds of Change, and Send Me an Angel. And there's some really good stuff on that. Um, I'm, I'm good to not hear Winds of Change again, but I really like Send Me an, an Angel and Don't Believe Her is cool. And there's some really good tunes on that one. So in terms of post that album which was, I mean, I, I saw them in Miami on the tour for that. And uh, so that was probably 1990. It's possible that it was 91. And uh, I saw them in an arena. So they were still of that size to play in an arena and had that popularity. And clearly that was their last like gigantic burst. 
Uh, creatively, there's some really awful albums like Eye to Eye and Pure Instinct and stuff like that. And and, and again, albums nobody should own. But I do. This is like, like th they have enough albums that I really like that the not good ones I keep in a drawer to occasionally return to and say maybe this isn't as bad as I thought. And occasionally you'll make a breakthrough with bands where you do that. Right, I have right. with those Scorpions albums, but they made one really good album after. Crazy World, uh, which was called Humanity Hour One with Dejamin Child, who worked with Kiss and a bunch of other people co-wrote. Uh, and then I think this is the other one. Like, I think they have two albums post-Crazy World that are really actually worth your time. And this thing is really well produced. Uh, you know, not for nothing, like, you could play this to somebody who maybe doesn't have an ear for what the modern production is that's happening here and tell them this was recorded in 1986 and they would believe you in terms of the energy and and klaus klaus mine's voice uh and uh you know that's that's certainly commendable and uh the drums are really punchy it's mickey d uh this is apparently where he went after uh motorhead which was which was after king diamond and they let him play uh like you would if if you were familiar with his playing and had an ear for drummers, you would know it's him. This isn't just like there's a name on the album and there's there's no change. Like there's an effect. That guy is a that guy clobbers the kit, really consistent hitter. Um, he's not showboating or anything, but uh, but it, it it benefits their sound. So uh, going through this album, gas in the tank. Um, uh, it's a pretty enjoyable. You're getting certain nods to age you know, throughout this album. And then you also get like the breakdown where they pull back the music and, and Klaus is just singing. He's like, you want it louder and doing his, doing his thing. And it's fun as, as they would do um, uh, in like, you know, in, in, in their older material roots in my boots, you were getting um, the kind of the blackout riff from Shanker. This album sort of like the Megadeth one, you're getting a lot of nods to the history of this band. Um, uh, Knock 'em Dead. You're hearing the kind of the Big City Nights riff from Shanker. That one's not so good with the chorus. Uh, Rock Believer. Uh, you get some cowbell happening in that one, um, and uh, and you're getting that other side of the Scorpions, which is I think like basically they have. I feel that they have two modes. There there are some other modes in the in the 70s, but I feel they have basically two modes, and it's party. And it's reflect upon life. And <laughs> rock believer is reflect upon life, and that's where you're getting the, the the like the holiday kind of song or send me an angel, where they're that plaintive side that actually a lot of German bands do well. Like those are some. I'm not a huge fan of Accept, but those are some of my favorite Accept songs. Are the ones where they're like getting into the whole somber, um, you know, where is life going? And um, it's it's that one. That one's pretty good. Um, uh, you get some, uh, you get some nice wah wah going in there, and then, and and then this is the really the surprise on this album. And for someone who's like, I don't want to, I have, I have no interest in Scorpions past, um, uh, Love at First Sting or whatever. Uh, Shining of Your Soul, which is the fifth song on this thing, um, it's 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 really nice, and you get. Um, you get like the, the reggae that they flirt with back in the old days of what's it, what's, what's that other one? I wrote it down like loving you Sunday morning. So they play around sometimes with reggae. That's a really, that's a real highlight. And then seventh son is a song. They haven't done anything like this since blackout. As far as I can recall, that has like, it's got like these harmonic notes in the intro kind of running with the devil, the bass throb. And then there's this lumbering, it's actually more like their seventies stuff and a little bit like. Uh, China White on Blackout, like this really sort of droning, unpleasant push. Um, and then the chorus uh, like reflects that mood. So the Seventh Sun doesn't actually fit in the, is it party or is it reflective? This is just sort of an unhappy landscape. And it's, it's pretty cool. Um, uh, hot and cold, uh, the chorus, not good. Uh, the verse is good. Uh, and then, and then he, <laughs> You get uh, when I lay my bones to rest, and this is just straight up bad. So you'll get these duds occasionally. Like this is like, I, I mean, I go I go back deep with music history. I got like uh, like you know 
en- en- Enrico Caruso recordings and, and, and Mathis records and all this sort of shit. But I've never really got into the original like Chuck Berry rock and roll. Uh, and so this album has that Chuck Berry rock and roll kind of feel, and I just don't like that thing. Um, Peacemaker, which was the single, um, you get like sort of the Mississippi Queen riff with like a Thin Lizzy tag on, like <laughs> so it's kind of like Mississippi Queen plus Thin Lizzy, and uh, it's enjoyable. The chorus is a little a little regular. Uh, Call of the Wild is is maybe the only song if you heard in some kind of context and someone said this album is from the 80s, where you would say, huh, that one really sounds like it's from the 90s. So they updated the sound to the 90s on that one. Uh, and then uh, the last song, the When You Know uh, Where You Come From, this is a strong ballad. This is the this is the reflective, thoughtful, um, uh, slightly forlorn uh, and, and melancholic Scorpions. And... Um, and it has a weight. Like these dudes have been doing this. I mean, I'm, I said I'm turning fifty in 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 January. Like these dudes have been playing longer than that. This band, and um, so there's some real weight. Like uh, with a ve- veterans of that caliber who actually have lived that lifestyle, have been like enormous superstars doing arenas, maybe stadiums at some point, having all these giant selling things, and then finding their niche. And their group and continuing to do this, obviously, for, for you know, like, I, I assume it's because they love doing it. I'm not assuming it is, like, that they're making an album like this. It's, like, just to rake in the cash. I think there's something that they enjoy. And um, and um, that, whole, you know, you're hearing Klaus, like, who's got to be well into his 70s, that, like, the be true to yourself, it's your life, um, with all the extra whys that he always puts in. Uh, you know, when, when he sings the letter I, uh, really enjoyable. So this, this thing is, this thing has an impact and it has some worse songs than say those albums that are, uh, lower than it on the list, but there overall, there's a real impact. And I felt like this album, this album concludes with that song and some of these highlights and stuff like this. And like, this would be a good album to end on. Like they, it's been, it's been something whenever humanity hour one came out, that was the last time they released anything. I thought that was really, really strong. So they, they've had a number of albums. I've liked far less uh, that have come out. And, 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 and I think this thing was pretty well received. So I think this is a, this is a good place to retire, you know, like have this as your final studio album, but uh, who knows, maybe this would swing. The momentum is there for better, more inspired songwriting, and they, they could they could churn out another. But this is a really respectable conclusion for, for veterans. Uh, like, it's it, it's it's a, it's a enjoyable album with a couple of duds, but also some ex- unexpected moments. I remember, I think they covered that. I was I wasn't there for it, but the album club talked about that. Record. Yeah, they did. They did. I think that they mentioned at some point during that, um, it, it was refreshing to have it felt like the songs they were writing went sort of in sync with where they were in their career and their age. Like it was, it was nice to have, you know, instead of what a, a lot of the, like they aren't writing uh, animal magnetism at this age, right? Like they're, they're, they've grown up a little bit, so we don't need Virgin yes. killer. <laughs> well, well chosen. Well chosen. Okay. So um, awesome. Uh, Do you have an affinity uh, for scorpions, or they're not for you? Oh yeah, no. Um, yeah. So I I have blackout and animal magnetism. They're the two that I I picked up, and I enjoy them. I don't know if you've heard me talk about um, sort of my interest with more traditional leaning metal. Yes, but, I've heard how you kind of roundabout gotten into it. Yeah, they, yeah. Scorpions definitely have much better albums than the two you're naming. I like both of those. Um, but those those are not their their top albums for me in in, in, in my estimation. I, I think, I mean, it's probably people would want you to start, you know, potentially there and earlier. Um, but it's it's a band that like I'm becoming more and more familiar with, and is essential um, to learn, especially like as the more the newer bands start to arrive, and I gain some interest in them. So. Right. Um, I'm kind of learning in two different directions, but it's been really cool to talk about because I am also looking for a bit more like practiced and experienced ears with it to try and provide like context to what I'm hearing. 
Right. Um, so on that note, I will flip this over and put myself center stage. Um, Venator. So uh, this is Echoes from the Gutter. Do you know this one at all? That's, uh, yeah, that's very high on my list. Okay. So um, do you want to go back and forth or do you want me to I wait? Mean, I mean, no. if I can say this if you want to talk about it when it comes down to that and we can, I can I, move on to the next you, 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 it, This is your program. It's, it's absolutely, <laughs> I, 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 okay. that, that is very high on my list. Uh, I, and I sent a copy, uh, a copy to Marty. I, I, I love that album. Okay. And um, so uh, however you want to do it. Okay. Um, well, I mean, I, I can I, talk about it when I'll I arrive. Be, I'll be brief here, and then I'll probably take my art. You know, when you bring it up later on, um, I'll, I'll kind of we'll be able to go back and forth and share some thoughts. But okay. I'll just for to stay this. When I heard their debut EP, um, that eventually was I, I think was originally released independently on cassette, and then Dying Victims picked it up for a vinyl release that they shared with Angel Sword. Um, but that the song Paradiser, I probably listened to five billion times. Um, it was just such an immediate, like, earworm. I, in terms of it, I, for three songs, it kept me sort of, you know, pinned to my seat, and I was super excited to hear that they had a full length coming out. In terms of bands right now that I think are doing this sort of, I think that casually talked about traditional heavy metal. Like I, I, I have a difficult time with that is just sort of understood as to what that is supposed to define. Um, right. But what I think people infer when they say that they're playing in the, the, that style. Um, and I'm hard pressed to name a whole lot of other bands right now that are doing it this way or as well, I should say. Yeah, uh, you're wearing a shirt for the only band that I think is doing it better. Um, okay. So we'll we'll uh, we'll get a bit. I'll get uh, your thoughts. I should say we'll share some thoughts on this record in greater depth when we get to it. But um, yeah, I was. This came out I think in like February or it was early in the year. Yeah, and this is an early album to get where I'm like this will definitely be in my top my top five at the end of the right, year. Right. And it was, it was going to be hard for anyone to unseat this. Um, and I waited for someone to, and it never happened. So um, one of my favorite traditional heavy metal records from a, a newer band this year. And uh, we'll, we'll spend some more time with it later. I'll put it to the side and we'll get there. So I'll uh, move from that record and we can go back to you here, Craig. And I'll let you. Okay. So this is one of two. I'm just going to show the cover as I, I took a screenshot I'm still waiting for the album to arrive uh, overseas. I wouldn't be surprised if this is somewhere on your list. Um, this is the uh, Sedimentum. Yeah. So um, I have less to say about this uh, than some of the other things, partially because I just haven't spent as much time with it. I've heard it, I think, three times. And just an aside, so this is a death metal band. Uh, from Canada. So Canada Canada is amply represented on this list. And the name of this album is Separation Morphogenesiac. Let me try that again. Separation <laughs> Morphogenesiac. I'm sure that is not correct. Yes. I, uh, <laughs> I I there there's some languages that I can that I can I can speak a little bit in or or in, in a couple cases actually pretty well in. French is not one of them at all. Uh, I look, I, and and so they're 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 from that part of Canada, presumably. Um, just an aside on death metal, I feel that more than any other genre, this gets a pass or a fail on the sound. And when I say the sound, I mean the production quality. And uh, like I, I, you know, I, I I I revealed earlier that I'm not into Testament. I'm not into Anthrax. Um, and I'm not into Overkill. There are a lot of classic bands I'm not into. It was one of the things um, that probably brought a lot of hate mail back when I wrote <laughs> Metal Maker in the day. And and I just because just because it came out in 1992 doesn't mean it's good. And one of the death metal bands that I never got into was Entombed. And I know that's like a sacred band for many many people. I think their sound is great. I probably listened to that first album a dozen times, and I don't think it's bad. But I just don't think the songs are there. I don't think the, the riffs are there. I think um, the mood is good and the sound is great. 
Uh, the second album I think is better, but actually Wolverine Blues is probably the only one of theirs that I can listen to and enjoy. And obviously that's leaning into the rock thing. This yeah. is all to say, I think a lot of death metal bands, people will really like them because of the sound more than any other genres. I'm not hearing people talk about traditional metal albums and all they're talking about is the guitar tone and the production. And, um, and so some of the death metal stuff, the classic albums that I'm not that into, like Incantation I think has a great sound. The riffs just haven't gotten to me. Uh, and, and, and same with um, Immolation. I think they have a really good sound, fantastic playing. It's just the riffs don't pull me in. And I've tried with those bands multiple times. And this isn't to say I think any of those three bands are, are bad. Whereas, like, actually, Anthrax and, and, and Testament, I think, have a, a lot of actively bad stuff. Um, uh, just a lot of that stuff, I think it's like in, there are bands that clearly took Incantation sound and I think just did better music. Uh, and, and, and an analogy I'll, I'll make is... In black metal, so Transylvanian Hunger and what's the Under a Funeral Moon or those two black, those two Dark Throne albums set the template for, for 10,000 black metal albums. And I don't particularly like those Dark Throne records. I don't think for me, I don't think the songs hold together that well. But man, I have I have probably the largest collection of moon blood in, you know, in, in New York State. Maybe like I think they're incredible. They're taking that sound, but I think just writing better music. So again, if you like these bands, great. If you like all of the classic stuff that is highly revered, um, be, you know, for whatever reason that that like I'm not telling people not to like it, but it's not often. I, I feel death metal more than any genre is the one where people just love the sound, and that gets them half the way there, and. And I'm not immune to that because I have sedimentum on this list. And I think this album sounds awesome. I think there were a bunch of death metal albums that were really well produced that came out this year. There's one by like Mortuos. I don't know how to pronounce it. Kaoshin. There are, there are like, I, and I, and I checked out all, and I checked out like all of these things. And, um, uh, and the reason that the sedimentum album makes it and some of those others don't is because I think that each one of their songs, um, in addition to having this really good sound and some really great grumbling bass in there, like that's really like nice and audible, they're they're kind of doing the chasm core thing, for lack of a better term. Like you're getting blasting or speed and uh, the really deep vocals. Their their vocalist is particularly good. So, like, the quality of his voice he reminds me a little bit of Morris Dallas Ra, if that's how you say his name. The guy from Necros Christos, who if you said, if you had the gun on me and said, who's the best metal, death metal vocalist of all time, that's the guy I'm naming. That guy is incredible. He's so tasteful with his lines. His voice is incredible. Uh, Germany gives us some good death metal vocalists because the guy in the Funeral Doom band, Worship, is my favorite death metal vocalist for a Funeral Doom band. Um, they're both phenomenal. So to me, this vocalist sounds a little bit like that. Also, um, the Japanese band Coffins and Anatomia, like it's that ultra deep, really inhuman quality that I like. So again, like I'm talking sound, like the sound of this is very rich, but also very organic. And um, uh, the the licks are a little bit in kind of the autopsy world. This is, a, this is another classic death metal band that I have some appreciation for, but don't adore the way the other people do. Like I know people will rank them with Morbid Angel and Carcass, and I will say that band should not be ranked with Morbid Angel and Carcass. Uh, but again, you like autopsy, great, great for you. I just, their licks don't catch me. And, and uh, so what Sedimentum does is like you're getting... Um, you're getting this really great sound, a, a vocalist who sounds good, everything that he does in every moment, and a vocalist who also knows the key or one of the keys to what I think good death metal singing is, which is come up with your own lines. And this is like if I have the biggest overriding criticism for death metal, um, death metal as a genre and death metal vocalists in particular, it's too often you'll get the guy singing either in lockstep with the riff or putting syllables on each beat or doing it in a really simple pattern. And so like guys like um, Corpse Grinder and, and Chris Barnes, like both of the Cannibal Corpse vocalists, both of these guys have great moments. 
And both of these guys also have shit that it sounds like if you put the lyrics in a computer, it would give you this because they're just putting a beat on every, they're just putting a syllable on every beat or they're just singing the, the riff. And this vocalist is his own presence and he has that like otherworldly thing, partially because he's not grooving and rocking in the same way. Um, and in general, that's like what these songs are. It's this great, rich sound with a, with a really nice bass guitar sound, distinct even with how deep and, and, and down tune that the, the riffing is. And then you'll get some riff that comes to the fore that's like that has some swagger and um, and that makes it memorable. And so the, the first the first one, like three minutes in, they switch to a six eight. Um, that's you know like that's a cool shift. The uh, the title cut has a longer lick that is sort of more recognizable as like the Swedish tremolo picking thing, like Dismember, um, or, or or maybe Entombed, but I think of Dismember is just writing better versions of those things. Then you get some blasting chaos. I don't know what's going on. Uh, and then they all hook up at four minutes and and it moves into like a death doom section that feels conclusive. So it feels like even though there's like basically one memorable riff, there's this syncopated moment where they all hook up at four minutes and then there's, and then this doomy thing at the end. And it feels like a well-constructed song, even though like if you just looked at these core riffs, like, I think one of them is memorable, um, but the overall sound of the band, their production and their arrangement pushes it to another level. Suplice, uh, the track six is really strong. That one is more like a funeral doom thing. And the vocals are particularly anguished, so you get another um, emotional color with him. Um, and uh, and then the last one, Un Grotesque Panorama. Uh, there's a blast beat that's like kind of barely holding the tempo and then and uh, under these slow chords. So you're getting that cool dichotomy of like slow guitars, fast blasting, which is kind of a... It's more of like a symphonic idea that you get in a lot of good metal. Uh, and then the album ends with this like eerie high note at the end. So it's really, um, it's really good. And I think like half of why it's good is, uh, is the sound, uh, like the sound of the, vo the, the quality of, of the vocalist, the sound of the guitars, the sound of the bass drum, the completely organic sound of the drums. And then half of it is they know how to shape their songs. And even if, even if it isn't loaded with memorable riffs like that, um, an album that I thought would be on this list but didn't land there, that Morbific album, um, that has a ton more riffs, but the arrangements just didn't, like, it's like, it didn't feel like they knew how to arrange these things as well. And a there very interesting production there too, right? What's up? The production on that one was also in pretty interesting, I thought. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and again, like, so there are a bunch of bands now doing this, and I try and stay away from, like, I just try and stay away from the old school terminology because first off, like bolt thrower, death, carcass, um, napalm death, morbid angel. That's the old school. None of those bands sound alike. So in terms of what they're doing, like this is a little bit like there is a little bit some of that like amorphous chasm core. And I don't know if that's the, actually the term, but I think you know what I mean when I say it, where it's that like just wash and you're not taking as much with you, but they're giving you stuff to remember each time. And the arrangement, like, I think the, like, this is like kind of a rare case of, I think the, the, the sum in, in metal, the sum really is quite a bit more than the parts. Like if you just heard these riffs out of context or whatever, it's like, this all really comes together with the full package. So, so I'd be, I'd be curious, I'd be curious to see where they go. I, I know they have, they, I think they have another couple releases, maybe demos or, shorter things, but I, I will check out more from them, but I'm more curious to see what they do after this than actually what they did before this. Cause I feel like this is, this is developing. And if those, if those songs had say two memorable riffs as opposed to one, um, considering they already have this, this innate gift for arranging the songs 
in their ear. Like there isn't there isn't a better sounding death metal album this year than this one. So like I'm not I say I'm not immune to that. You know, a lot of a lot of uh, value is placed on the sound in death metal. I think more than any other genre um, of of metal, and this has a particularly excellent sound. Would you say like that? That element has is do you, how I would want to phrase this. Is that um, approach or philosophy more prevalent now than it was for someone who I was curious? Like, ha, were you always a, like a death metal fan? Did you move from thrash into death metal? I so no, I well yes, but there was a gap. There was a there was a hurdle for me to getting into death metal because of the vocals, and um, so I was like. You know, 80s traditional metal stuff, thrash, um, but not liking a fair amount of the, the the thrash that's like, you know, considered absolutely essential. Um, I have, a, I have a, a, a complex relationship with Slayer, um, mainly because of the vocals. Show No Mercy, I think, is awesome. But like, I just feel like there's an effort there. Um, and uh, I heard Heartwork. Actually, I think it was on Headbangers Ball. They had the video for Heartwork by Carcass. And because the twin guitar stuff was so to the fore, and I was so into Thin Lizzy and Wishbone Ash and, um, and Iron Maiden, and that appealed to me. So I was like, this is really good. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get into these vocals. So I think that album was 93. It might be 94. I think it was 93. Are you talking about uh, Heartwork? Heartwork. Yeah, yeah. I think it was 93. So that was it. So I got that album and um, and then I got their other stuff. Uh, checked out Entombed at the time, didn't get into them, but then got Blessed Are the Sick and that opened up the Morbid Angel thing. So that was that was when it happened. So there was, but there's a bit of a lag. Like it wasn't like I went straight into that as it was coming out. Like in the 80s, I didn't, I, I'd heard, um, I'd heard death and it didn't appeal to me. Um, and I'd heard uh, Bathory, which is obviously not death metal, but right. like I heard some of that stuff, and it didn't appeal to me then. And it was more in the in the nineties when I discovered some of that late eighties, late eighties stuff. And the reason uh, that I guess getting to like mid late nineties, then I'm educating myself on all this, and I'm like, oh, still don't care that much for these early entombed albums, but like this Morbid Angel catalog is is certainly well worth owning. Because I, I was curious if. Um, I guess uh, that if it's more prevalent now for people to be attracted to just the immediacy of the sound, they recognize a certain degree of like production quality or guitar tuning or that grabs them and immediately gives a sense of approval, right? Right. I think, well, I mean, there are obviously so many more things you have access to. So it's, 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 it's tricky to make the comparison. Like when I checked out in tune, I literally went to tower records in a listening station. That was how, that was how I did it. I just got home. I'm like, I got to get some more of this death metal because I turned the corner on. I'm like, I like these vocals. And that was, that was the album that brought me around. And then I'm, you know, I'm checking, I'm checking that thing out and there's just less access. But I think, um, you know, and this is some of the, you know, like the nostalgia factor for, for different people, which is less of a factor for me. Like I, I like I look at a year end list and I'm hoping they're going to be some legacy bands. I'm hoping they're going to be some newer bands that are building a good catalog. And I'm hoping they're going to be some bands I'd never heard of before. And that 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 is the case um, specifically for me. But I. um yeah, I mean, really, like, if you're, like, the the production, as they're just figuring it out, I mean, Rico Putrefaction, this is really not good production. Blessed Are the Sick, this is really not good production, to my ears. Maybe there's somebody who likes that production. Yeah. Um, but, like, that triggered out, that triggered out sound on Blessed Are the Sick, and also, like, when the blast beats don't, are, aren't actually in, in, in time with the music, and it's just the blast beat is happening, and then they all hook up again. Um, you know, like, when people people didn't talk about production as much like in that time, other than everybody hated the shit out of how Injustice for All sounded. <laughs> like that, like everyone hated the shit out of that. By the way, it's not a great sound, but I don't dislike that sound. And and man, I think if 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 you're into certain era of Rod and Christ, that's that sound. Like those those guitars and that drum production, like that's the sound they're using. And and sometimes the riffs. So 
the but your point that's a perfect segue to the next record i was going to pull out so this is the the record for me this year that uh our death metal record that i would see met the same criteria so on an annual basis i probably have at this point in time a couple of records that i will go all in on that i say like Yes, it's doing this style of death metal that is incredibly popular right now. I only have so much space in my sort of listening habits for them. I can't, I've been part of, I don't want to say this. I've been paying attention to that sound. It's become more pervasive for me for over a decade now. So... Mm -hmm. I've started to, my enthusiasm has slowed a little bit for it, but on sure. a very consistent basis, I will have, uh, and every year, like three or four that I'll go like, yeah, that cross that I was hungry for and it was there for me sort of deal. Right. I have a genre that I do that with as well, where I'm like, I don't need a, I don't need a lot of these. Like de death metal, I listen to so much and so regularly that like, Pretty good and good is worth seeking out for me. But but I know what you're saying, and I have that with some genres. But I'm um, like, yeah, I'll get one of those this year. <laughs> so this is uh, Rotten Tomb. And a third yes. date. do you know this one? I just I ordered that two days ago. I saw it on, you know, one of uh, like I think it was was it was it was a Grizzly Butts? It's like yes. one of a couple websites. Yes. It was their number one release. And and I checked it out a little bit earlier. I was like, this is pretty I'm like that's a solid album. And if I had it, there's a decent chance it would make this list. It's really well written. So Josh does a great job. I love his writing. Is um, he the Grizzly Butts guy? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't I don't know who I don't know yeah. the other name. Yeah, I so I've been I've been reading him for a while and um he, I'm I'm originally from the Pacific Northwest. He's from from out there, but yeah, he's he does a great job. I, I'm very much a fan of his writing. Um and so I, I will use well if, for everyone who's watching this. If you are not reading Grizzly Butts, um, Spirit Coffin Publishing, he also has a he's probably working on his second issue of his zine um, and a, a label. But anyway, please read his review on this, um, and then because uh, I'm just going to second a lot of his opinions here. But the sound, so it's not really as much the guitar work for me but it's the drums. There's like an opening part of this that the toms harken back to like early Sepultura. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it just is so refreshing to hear a drum sound that feels like whatever, 1988 um, right. on a death metal record. It, it is, you know, heavier. And it, um, I think the vocalist um, sounds, I think he mentions in his review um, like Jimmy Carlson from Gormant. Um, I don't know if you're into them at all, um, but yeah, no, that I, well into the, I have one album by them. That is, that is really good. Do that. I, I, I actually don't know what else they have, but I have the <laughs> classic album and it's, really yeah, good. it's, it's, there is one classic album. There's a lot of other sort of uh, less sort of climactic or, you know, essential listening, I would say, but. Yeah, like not like on the melodic side, but not melodic side. Like we're you know we're gonna have a rowing pit of Mata Marth, but like <laughs> on the melodic side, like we are going to weep rivers for all the death happening. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But um, this came out early in the year. I want to say like January, February. No, wait, March. So very early in March. And it crossed it off the list for me. Um, I, just so you know, a little bit about my bias. The Chilean metal scene is my favorite in country uh, to get metal from, period. Um, Doom, death, thrash, black metal that's coming out of Chile. There are several bands from that country on my list here um so i there's a 
I can, you can guarantee it's going to be the country that is highlighted every year for me. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's 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 a good bias to have. Do you have? A, I think it was a year ago or two years ago, and I've never heard anyone talk about this. And I think they're Chilean invocation. Um, I don't think so. I think they're Chilean. Um, um, but that yeah, that record that you just showed, I think, is really good. And then there's another one that again. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, Attunement to death. It was on Iron Bonehead. I recognize the name. Yes, but I, you're talking about yeah. Quite, quite good. Like standout, standout stuff. And then the other Chilean one. Like t- to me, there were two Chilean bands that I learned about. Totally last minute. I'm like, this isn't. I don't have time to familiarize myself with that. But the one you just showed, I bought. So that one is coming. I bought through Bandcamp. So that's coming. And then the other one that struck me was there's a thrash band maybe called Hellish. Mm-hmm. And all this shit is that ripping right hand. That's not like, yeah. like off the charts right hand, yeah. uh, right hand work. So yeah, there's a lot of good stuff there. That's a good bias to have. I look forward to uh, to learning about some gems from you. Um, anyway, but in terms of crossing that sort of sound off for me this year, um, it, it wasn't nuts. Yes, like there's strong incantation emulation vibes here, which is sort of the centerpiece for much of what makes up like the modern sort of you want to call it like the vast majority of bands that are sort of operating in this cavern sort of sound but um the the drum sound here for me sort of grabbed me and uh was the first thing that noticed kept pulling me back to this record in terms of like the heavy blasphemous you know riffs that are so melted sort of like flesh from the bone sort of vibes yeah right. like this this did that uh fulfilled that appetite here in 2022 for me so i i I'm excited to hear what you think when you finally get a chance to spit it on your own yeah i mean to me i'll, I'll say like that i was thinking that when i said you know there are like those classic incantation albums but then i hear other people take that sound and write albums that i like more with them you just held one up there you go. Like it just, it's just the riffs appeal to me more. And it isn't like I, I can, you know, like just because you break ground doesn't make your stuff great. Obviously, it doesn't make it bad. But like sometimes it's like you're breaking the ground and then other people, you know, with melody, it's so it's so distinct to an individual. Just their, their riffs just uh, really uh, the riffs and their, their sense of song craft. I would say like they, they really know how to arrange stuff. I, I, I enjoyed it. I, I spun it twice and, and bought it, but it, it hasn't arrived yet. Um, uh, just in case I forgot to mention the title, Visions of a Dismal Fate. There we go. 